welcome, welcome. Uh, this is another Wellness Institute webinar here. Uh, today we're doing one on pickleball here, so we're just going to wait a minute or so for a couple other folks to come on in here. Um, the format for uh, today's webinar, though, is um, we'll be giving the presentation and then doing question and answers after. So if you've got any questions as we're going through here, just uh, fill them in in the, in the chat box there, type them in, and we'll be sure to ask uh, Dr. Weber here after she's finished her presentation. Oh, I got a few more trickling in here. Very nice. All right. Well, I can even uh, I can even start with a little bit of the introduction here. So pickleball is said to be the fastest growing sport in North America. Uh, according to a recent survey, the number of participants in Canada has tripled over the past two years. While it has traditionally attracted older adults, many younger adults are now taking up the game. We will discuss what makes this sport so appealing during this webinar and the physiological demands and health benefits associated with playing singles and doubles. Dr. Dr. Sandra Weber is leading the webinar here. She is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy, uh, College of Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Her research focuses on measuring physical activity ambulation and sedentary behavior in older adults and people with chronic diseases. She frequently uses technology such as uh, pedometers, accelerometers, smartwatches, and GPS devices to provide objective measures of activity in daily, everyday life. You will often find uh, Dr. Weber out on the pickleball court when she's not working. Thanks very much for that introduction there, Darren. And thanks everyone for coming to the talk today. Uh, as Darren mentioned, my aim is to give you an overview of the sport of pickleball, how it's played, why it's so popular, and what health benefits can be achieved by playing pickleball. We'll even discuss a little bit about psychological reasons for playing. Uh, as Darren suggested, this is one of my favorite topics, pickleball, and my family gets tired of me talking about it, so I'm glad to have a different audience today. I'm Sandra Weber and I'm a physiotherapist and as mentioned I work in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Manitoba. Much of the information that I'm going to be presenting today comes from my experience with the sport but I will also provide some information from the health literature about heart rate and step responses uh, in singles and doubles players and give you some uh, feel for the data that we collected uh, last summer with a team of researchers uh, including Brenda Tittlemeyer, who is a PhD candidate in the Applied Health Sciences program at the U of M, and four Master of Physical Therapy students, Scott, Logan, Sava, and Shad, who are uh, going to be graduating and starting their clinical careers as physiotherapists this fall. So generally, this is what I'm planning to cover in the next 30 minutes or so. We'll start out talking about how popular the sport is and what's attracting people to the game and I'll throw in some stats about player numbers in North America. I'm going to spend a little time talking about the court and basic rules, and then move on to discussing the physiological demands of the sport. Basically what we found when we collected data with smartwatches and accelerometers. I'll tell you something about common injuries experienced by pickleball players, and try to impress upon you the importance of a proper warm up and the importance of maintaining an overall good level of fitness with activities outside of pickleball. Then I'll wrap up by discussing psychological and sociological aspects associated with the game and let, let you know how you can get started or play even more if you're not new to the game. Hopefully that sounds all right to you. Let's get started. Maybe you've seen some of these headlines or similar headlines in the newspapers, magazines and other news outlets that you visit. Pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports in North America, if not the fastest growing. Although the game was originally invented more than 55 years ago, it has really just become better known in the last 10 years. And popularity seems to have skyrocketed specifically over the last two years during the pandemic. Maybe one of the reasons that the word is getting out is that famous people like Matthew Perry, Brené Brown, and Leonardo DiCaprio have gone on record talking about how much they love the sport. Luxury resorts are offering pickleball retreats and professional leagues are cropping up. But more importantly, the game has taken hold en masse at the grassroots level. USA Pickleball reports that there are now 39% more Americans playing pickleball compared to just two years ago. 
They estimate that 4.8 million people play pickleball in the US. The Canadian stats are similar, with Pickleball Canada reporting that numbers of players have tripled in the last two years, and we now have surpassed 1 million people who've tried pickleball in Canada. Based on the Pickleball Canada stats, 45% of athletes play four or more times per month. So that means half of Canadian players play at least once a week. The majority of Canadians who have paid their membership and joined Pickleball Canada are 55 years of age or older, but a recent survey showed that the fastest growing segment of players in our country is between 18 and 34 years of age. So you might ask what this sport with a funny name is all about. Pickleball has been described as a cross between tennis, badminton, and ping pong. It's played on a badminton sized court, which is substantially smaller than a tennis court. But like tennis, with a, with a typical shot, the ball is allowed to bounce once and players hit the ball back and forth across the net. Singles and doubles players compete using a plastic wiffle ball and a solid paddle. Serves are delivered underhand and ground strokes, volleys and smashes are executed similar to tennis. The game is relatively easy to learn and most people, especially those who have a background in racket sports, are able to play with reasonable proficiency without putting in months or years of practice to fine tune technique as is often required in games like golf or tennis. I think this is what makes pickleball so accessible. Many people are able to play at a level that provides enjoyment after even just a few weeks of practice. And of course, there are many levels of play and this tends to be respected with groups forming for players with different skill levels. At the elite level, experienced players can turn the game into a very fast paced competitive pursuit with lots of net play. Of course, the reasons that people find the game enticing vary from person to person. Because it's relatively easy to learn and it doesn't require a large investment of time and effort before you start having fun, that might be what attracts you initially. The sport's also relatively inexpensive and doesn't require much for equipment beyond a paddle that can range anywhere from $30 to $300, balls that are $4 each, and running shoes. More and more outdoor courts are popping up all over the place. In Winnipeg, we have only a small number of dedicated purpose-built outdoor pickleball courts, although hopefully that's going to change uh, fairly substantially in the next year or two. We do also have a number of city-run tennis courts that have pickleball lines added to them and some outdoor hockey rinks that also have pickleball lines down. So if people have a portable net, then they can be set to go at these places. During the winter, we have to move indoors, unlike our lucky, uh, the lucky folks in the southern states. But pickleball courts use the same outer lines as a badminton court, so most gymnasiums can be used. Pickleball is naturally a very social game, and typically there's a lot of laughing on the court. Doubles is much more popular than singles. This is probably because you have two people to cover the court, and the game tends to be more social, involve a lot of strategy. Most recreational groups play with a rotating format, whereby players rotate courts after each 10 or 15 minute game, resulting in interaction with many different players over the course of a few hours of playing. <clears throat> the same court is used for singles and doubles in pickleball, and it's set up similar to a tennis court with right and left service courts. However, different from tennis, a pickleball court has a seven foot non volley zone, which is referred to the kitchen right at, at the front of the court uh, just beyond the net. Hopefully you're able to see my little mouse there uh, showing you the red section on this diagram. We sure this is the, okay, good. As the non-volley name suggests, uh, this, this is the area where you're not allowed to volley. So you're not allowed to step into this area and hit a volley or a smash. Uh, if you want to volley, which means hit the ball before it bounces, players need to stand back outside of this uh, red zone, so in the blue zone, in order to hit the ball before it's bounced. However, players are allowed to step into the kitchen or the non-volley zone to hit a ball that has already bounced in the kitchen. And this often sets up what is known as a dinking rally. A dink is a short shot that bounces in the kitchen. So a dinking rally happens 
when opponents continually hit soft, low, uh, short shots back and forth over the net, landing back and forth in the red zone here. This is common in intermediate, intermediate and advanced level doubles and contributes a lot to the strategy of the game. The object is to softly move the ball around uh, so that eventually your opponent makes a mistake and returns the ball a little bit long and a little bit higher to you. And then you're able to put the ball away with a hard volley or a smash without needing to step into the kitchen. So that's part of the reason that, that that is a lot of the strategy of doubles is not to just hit it back and forth as hard as you can over the net, but to actually get into these dinking rallies with the short shots, shorts, short shots back and forth over the net until someone hits one a little bit higher and then you're able to put it away with a smash without having to step into the kitchen or the non-volley zone. And that's a big difference between um, pickleball and tennis. The game starts with one player standing behind the baseline delivering an underhand serve diagonally from the right side of their court to their opponent's right service area. So the yellow player would serve uh, in this position to uh, the pink player over on this side. The pink player must let the serve bounce once and then hits the ball back over the net and they can hit it back into either side when, when the pink player returns the ball. The player who served must allow the first return ball to bounce once before they can hit it back. This is called the two bounce rule. So the yellow person hits the serve into this court here, pink person hits it back, it has to bounce once, then the yellow person can do whatever they want. So they, can, they have to hit it back after it's bounced once, but then they can move forward up to the non-volley zone line and they could hit the next one as a volley if they wanted to, if, there, if the shot came to them uh, that way. So this is called the two bounce rule that it has to bounce once on each side at the beginning of a rally. After the ball has bounced once in each team's court, both teams may either volley the ball or play it off a bounce, whichever they want to with a ground stroke. The two bounce rule eliminates the serve and volley advantage that happens in tennis and allows for longer rallies in the game of pickleball. In pickleball, the server only gets one chance to deliver the serve, not two, like in tennis. But this is usually not a problem since the serve is not a highly technical shot. No. Oh. Uh, a little bit more on this slide. The yellow player would continue uh, serving from the alternate from alternate sides until they lose a point. So they serve from the right to the right, then they serve from the left to the left on the next uh, point. But when they lose a point, uh, then the uh, serve passes to the opposite player. So then the pink player would have uh, won the right to serve. So that's called a side out basically when the serve switches from the yellow person to the pink person. And, and they would start serving uh, again from the right side uh, for their game. Um, so this is true that you always start serving from the right side at the beginning of a game, but in singles, um, once the yellow person then warns their serve back, it depends what their score is. So if their score is an even number, so 0, 2, 4, they would start from the right side again. But if their score is an odd number, 1, 3, 5, then they would serve from the odd side or the left side. And again, that's how things work in singles. This all gets a little bit more complicated in doubles because you now have two servers on each team. And I'm not gonna spend a lot more time explaining the serving sequence rules because it's honestly easier to learn it on the court. And if you're not that familiar with the rules, it probably isn't going to help uh, you much for me to say a few lines here today. But suffice to say that both players on the serving doubles team have the opportunity to serve and score points until they as a team commit a fault, in which case the serve then passes to the other team. Uh, like in singles, a team can only score points when they are serving. If the first server loses their service point, then the serve passes to their teammate. So if this person served, hit it over into the pink side here, they hit it back and then this person hits it into the net, then the serve would pass to their uh, partner 
and this person would serve over into this pink person's left side court. And if, if the yellow team then won the point, then this player here would move over to here and serve this way and keep alternating until the yellow team loses the point. And then it would pass over to the, uh, the serve would pass over to the pink team and they would start on the right side. Now, what I just said is all true, except for the very first point of the game. So whichever team is serving first, let's say it's the yellow team is going to serve first, and usually that's decided just uh, by people deciding, or sometimes people are flipping a coin to decide which team will serve first. But whichever team serves first in the game, they actually only get one serve the first time. But then after that, each team will, will go through both of their two servers before the serve passes to the other team. Normally, games are played to 11 points with a win by two rule. Servers are expected to call out the score before hitting the ball, so before they contact the ball. And the score is called with three numbers. They first say the serving team score, then their opponent's score, and then either a one or a two to denote whether they are the first or the second server on their team. So a score could be something like 3-3-1. Three, three, if the game is tied at three, and if it's the first person on the team who is currently serving. If you're interested in learning more about the game, I encourage you to watch players in action, maybe there at the wellness or on an outdoor court this spring. There are also lots of other resources available on the web on the Pickleball Canada website, which I wanted to show you first, as well as on the USA Pickleball website. And there's also a lot of other information available on, on the web. So, <laughs> here we go. Uh, you can find instructional videos, blogs, and podcasts all over the place to help you learn about the game, improve your technique, advance your understanding of the rules and strategy, etc. All right, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and tell you about a research study that we conducted last summer. Uh, and fall here in Manitoba. In Pickleball Canada's survey that they conducted uh, this past January, 66% of baby boomers who play pickleball indicated that they play primarily for health and fitness benefits. So the question is, does the sport of pickleball actually provide health and fitness benefits? Somewhat surprisingly, very little research has been conducted in this area. So our team set out to collect heart rate and step data achieved by both doubles and singles players to try to answer this question. We used Garmin smartwatches worn on the wrist to collect information about heart rates and accelerometers worn on the hip to record steps in 31 doubles players and 22 singles players. None of our participants were true beginners. Many were strong intermediate level players. As listed on this slide, the average age of participants was 61 to 63 years of age, and most people had been playing pickleball for three to five years. The majority indicated that they played more than five hours of pickleball per week, which might seem like a lot, but it might just be two outings because most people tend to play for two or three hours at a time. We analyzed the accelerometer data, accelerometer data to filter out time spent that we, when people were standing still in between playing games in the uh, one to one and a half hours of time that we collected the data for. We found that participants were active for about 80% of the time that they wore the monitors. They registered more steps per hour in singles play, about 3,300, compared to doubles play, which was about 2,800 steps per hour. We collected our doubles uh, data outdoors, and so we were able to use the GPS feature on the Garmin watchers to, to determine the distances covered during the entire sessions. On average, players traveled 5.4 kilometers during their monitored time. We then analyzed our data to determine time spent in different heart rate zones. You can determine your estimated maximum heart rate using this formula, 220 minus your age. So if you're 60 years old, your estimated maximum heart rate is 160 beats per minute. 
The American College of Sports Medicine defines moderate intensity physical activity as that which puts your heart rate in the range of 64 to 76% of your estimated heart rate maximum. And they define vigorous intensity as 76% or higher relative to your maximum predicted uh, heart rate. So for our 60 year old, moderate intensity physical activity would mean that their heart rate was somewhere between 102 and 122 beats per minute. And vigorous activity would make their heart rate heartbeat faster than 122 beats per minute. Our doubles participants spent 45% of their time in, moderate, in a moderate intensity heart rate zone and 27.5% of their time in vigorous intensity. When we tested people playing singles, uh, they spent a slightly greater amount of time in the vigorous heart rate intensity zone, so 33.5, and slightly less in the moderate intensity uh, zone because it was basically, that time was transferred over to vigorous intensity. Regardless, the good news here is that for this group of intermediate level players, the majority of time spent playing pickleball, just over 70% if you add these two numbers together, resulted in heart rates in the moderate to vigorous intensity heart rate zones. Canada's 24-hour movement guidelines suggest that adults should engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week, as well as participate in resistance training at least twice per week and several hours of light activity every day. Given that we found that 70% of pickleball playing time was at a moderate or vigorous level, these participants that we tested could meet the recommended guidelines of 150 minutes with just three and a half hours of on-court pickleball time per week. And likely people are not just going to play pickleball a couple of times a week. They should also do some resistance training and walking. But the bottom line is that pickleball provides enough, enough of a cardiovascular stimulus for it to substantially contribute to recommended physical activity uh, guidelines, at least at the intermediate level. Because pickleball also involves a lot of rapid changes in direction, forwards, backwards, side to side, and also involves reaching and jumping for some shots, it likely also provides a very good stimulus for bone. And doing activities to maintain bone density is certainly important as we age. So as you can see, this sport has many health and fitness benefits. Having said all that, pickleball, like any sport, does present some risk for injury. Not surprisingly, common injuries experienced are similar to those reported in other racket sports. These include both chronic overuse types of conditions and acute injuries. A recent study of pickleball and tennis related injuries treated in American emergency departments from 2010 to 2019 found that the most common diagnoses for athletes 60 years of age and older were the same for the two sports. For pickleball players, 33% of injuries were joint sprains and muscle strains, 28% were fractures, usually of the wrists and fingers, and 11% were contusions and abrasions. Another 11% of incidents included medical conditions like fainting or cardiovascular events, chest pain, atrial fibrillation. The remaining 17% of injuries consisted of internal injuries, lacerations, dislocations, concussions, and eye injuries. Interestingly, men were three and a half times more likely than women to suffer a pickleball-related strain or sprain whereas women were more, more than three and a half times likely to suffer a fracture and more than nine times more likely to suffer a wrist fracture in particular. The prevalence of pickleball related injuries grew rapidly over the study period compared to the number of tennis injuries, which was stable. This is likely due to the popularity of pickleball and the greater numbers of people who are discovering it and getting injured each year. This study also reported common mechanisms of injury reported by pickleball players. Most injuries, two thirds of them, occurred as a result of a slip, trip, fall, or dive, whereas about one quarter were as a result of a specific movement, like a sudden stop, a lunge, bending. 3% involved hitting an object, like the fence, wall, or net. 3% were heat related, and 1% occurred as a result of being hit by a ball, paddle, or plate. And remember, these are injuries that involve people going to emergency departments. So there also are a number of injuries, probably the majority of injuries that happen in pickleball, 
where people don't land in the emergency department. And so the statistics related to those injuries that uh, didn't result in people going to emergency are probably slightly different. If you spend any time watching pickleball on a typical court here in Manitoba, you may be struck by the number of players that you see wearing knee braces and elbow straps. Unfortunately, tennis elbow doesn't just affect tennis players. It's commonly seen in athletes uh, of all kinds of racket sports and also in many adults, usually over the age of 40, who don't pick up a paddle or racket on a regular basis. Tennis elbow is formally known as lateral epicondyle tendinopathy and it refers to pain and dysfunction in the common tendon for the wrist extensors. So that's the uh, muscles on the back of your forearm that you use to bend your wrist up or backwards with. Pickleball players who dramatically increase the amount of time devoted to the sport and the amount of time that they're gripping their paddle and or who change their paddle, perhaps to something that allows more vibration to be transmitted to the arm, are at an increased risk for developing tennis elbow, especially if they also have other risk factors for tendinopathy, which include diabetes, high cholesterol, older age, male sex, and inflammatory or autoimmune conditions. Tennis elbow pain is usually isolated to a consistent spot here on the outside of the elbow that the athlete can pinpoint with one or two finger pads. So that's one of the ways that you can try to figure out if what you actually have is tennis elbow. The pathology associated with tennis elbow is complex and variable, involving inflammation of connective tissue around the tendon, partial tendon tears, and degeneration of tendon tissue. Repetitive exposure to loads that exceed the tendon's capacity is the primary contributor to the problem. The wrist extensor muscles are especially active and exert load through the tendon with backhand shots. So that's where people will often feel their elbow sore. But uh, these muscles are also stabilizing the wrist with other shots like forehands, volleys, and smashes. So that tendon chain doesn't get a rest anytime that the, the person is gripping the paddle. The localized pain tends to be worse with high loads on the tendon. So again, with something like a backhand shot, and the pain can actually seem to get better with a little bit of play. It might be stiff, stiff to start with and then ease up, but it usually gets worse as people continue to play and they get fatigued. If you suspect that you might have tennis elbow, I suggest you see a physiotherapist to rule out other causes of lateral elbow pain, like a muscle strain, nerve entrapment, or a sprain of a ligament, and to receive early education and exercises to help reduce your recovery time. Depending on how irritable the tendon is, you might need to take a short break from playing pickleball and other gripping activities. The bad news is that tendons need a lot of time to heal and recovery can take several months. The good news is that exercise-based rehab programs can help. Specific exercises with resistance levels tailored to the tendon's capacity to withstand a load during the healing process are the cornerstone of therapy and are required in order to try to reduce the likelihood of recurrence. So while complete rest will reduce pain, exercise is needed to strengthen the tendon to withstand the loads in the future. Physios, if you see a physio, might use a number of other treatments to try to reduce pain, like ice or heat, acupuncture, laser, but following a, a slowly progressive loading program is the key to recovery. Also, you can use a counterforce elbow brace or a strap around the upper forearm, this level of your uh, forearm, uh, that's recommended to help uh, in recovery and also potentially to reduce the likelihood of recurrence once your arm is actually feeling good. There are two kinds of warm up, and both of these are important for reducing the likelihood of injury and re injury if players are recovering from an injury. From what I've seen, players typically head straight out onto the pickleball court and start hitting balls back and forth to get warmed up. But engaging in some light aerobic activity by either briskly walking or jogging around the courts for three to five minutes and doing some specific exercises to put your key joints, like the hips, knees, ankles, and shoulders through their full range of motion are more likely to truly increase your muscle temperatures and limber you up for play. Once you're warmed up, then you should begin with your pickleball shot warm up to get your body and mind uh, ready for the game. 
There are a number of websites and videos on YouTube that you can check out to get an idea about some uh, ideal pickleball warm-ups. This is one example from a site called The Pickleball Doctor that has information about injury prevention, warming up, cooling down, and return to play after injury. Maintaining overall fitness by engaging in resistance training and flexibility exercises outside of playing time are also important. Remember this little graphic here on the right side that I showed you before? Uh, this is from Canada's 24-hour movement guidelines. Well, in addition to striving for, for the at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity each week, it's also recommended that we engage in resistance training twice a week and light activity, other light activities every day. Resistance training helps to maintain strength and has beneficial effects for bone. The jury is still out regarding the benefits of stretching and flexibility exercises. We no longer necessarily believe that stretching will decrease the likelihood of injury. Um, performing a warm-up that actually gets the blood flowing and increases temperature in muscles is more likely to be more protective. However, maintaining flexibility is important for function on and off the court. So maintaining range of motion about the hips, knees and shoulders can help you to move more naturally on the court and hit your short shots more effectively and efficiently, which hopefully also will reduce the likelihood that you place additional strain on other parts, like your back, for example. As I mentioned earlier, I was somewhat surprised when looking at the published literature regarding pickleball that there are very few studies reporting physiological responses. What is interesting is that there are a number of studies that have focused on sociological and psychological aspects of the game and characteristics of the people that play pickleball. Research suggests that the top two reasons that people play are for fitness and socialization. However, people demonstrate different levels of psychological connection to the sport, and those who exhibit more attachment and commitment to pickleball are also motivated by opportunities for skill mastery and competition. One study examined personality traits in 250 pickleball players at a seniors game competition in the US. Compared to the average population, pickleball players' personalities generally lean towards higher levels of agreeableness, so generosity, helpfulness, and willingness to compromise, and higher levels of conscientiousness, the ability to sustain concentration, avoid impulse behavior, and seek better results, and lower levels of neuroticism, so lower levels of anxiety, fear, anger, sadness, and dissatisfaction. These characteristics also tend to be associated with well-being. Studies to date are not conclusive about whether people with these qualities are drawn to pickleball or whether pickleball facilitates their development. It's likely that this varies between people and involves a combination of both factors. Leisure activities, so free time activities or non-work activities, are categorized by sociologists and psychologists as either casual or serious. Casual leisure usually consists of immediate, in-the-moment types of activities and often involve passive entertainment. Serious leisure involves the occasional need to persevere, so to overcome fatigue, embarrassment, or injury. It also in involves investing significant personal effort, developing a social world and identifying strongly with the activity and its associated subculture. Individuals who engage in serious leisure often structure their lives around the activity and it takes priority over other things. Some people take on volunteering or marathon running as serious leisure pursuits. Now pickleball has also been added to the list. What's interesting about this is that engaging in serious leisure is associated with increased subjective well-being for many people, and that is a key indicator for health and quality of life. People tend to find activities to be meaningful if they can develop skills, improve their competence, find enjoyment in the activity, socialize, and improve their health. Serious leisure can also lead to feelings of personal enrichment, positive self-expression, and enhanced self-image. And of course, participation in leisure that involves physical activity improves cognitive and physical functioning and reduces health risks. So I wanna emphasize that pickleball doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily going to become a serious leisure pursuit for everyone who takes up the game. 
Pickleball isn't unique in this area of the serious leisure pursuits. Uh, people who do crafts, bird watching, gardening, etc., in a serious way can also benefit from the positive aspects of serious leisure. That is to experience general well-being through setting and meeting goals and experiencing self-actualization and fulfillment. But pickleball is becoming uh, one of the common ways or, or more popular in terms of people taking it up in a serious way these days. And I do think that we, I definitely have seen a, no, a number of people who, um, for, who, for whom this, is, this has become a serious leisure pursuit for them. So hopefully now that I'm getting towards the end of my talk, you're able to list a number of reasons why people should give pickleball a try. If we were sitting together in person, I'd ask you to share your ideas on this with me and the rest of the audience. However, um, because we're working on this webinar format today, I've pulled together a few of the ideas that we covered. The most common reasons that people say they play pickleball is for fitness and socialization. It's fun and you can meet a lot of great people when you play pickleball. Most groups mix up the players on the courts after 10 or 15 minutes. So you get to meet a number of different people each day. You can play the game both indoors and outdoors. So you can play year round, even in a place like Winnipeg. And you don't need a lot of expensive equipment. It's relatively easy to learn the game in a relatively short period of time. And it's intellectual. As you get better, you can start to learn more about the strategy of the game, especially doubles. It's good for your physical health and it improves fitness. Doubles pickleball provides a moderate to vigorous aerobic stimulus for many intermediate level players and therefore contributes to meeting weekly recommended physical activity levels. And finally, for some individuals, pickleball can become a serious leisure activity, which can enhance overall wellness and quality of life. For those of you who haven't tried pickleball before, hopefully I've convinced you to find out more about the sport. And for those of you who are already enthusiasts, hopefully I've given you some talking points you can use to con convince more of your friends or family to try the game. If you're wondering where you can play, talk to the folks at the Wellness Institute and check out the information posted on the Pickleball Manitoba website. Pickleball Manitoba does have a list of places to play both indoors and outdoors in Winnipeg and outside of Winnipeg around our province. So go to their website and see what's listed. That's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I welcome any questions or feedback people may want to share at this time. Uh, okay, uh, one, one of the questions here, uh, when you're playing doubles and you're, it isn't the initial starting serve, so the server alternates sides until they fault and then it goes to the second team member who will alternate, alternate sides with their serves until they fault and then it goes to the opposing team to begin their serving. So that, that's that's the, the routine with the, the setting that up? That is correct, yes. And so and that is true in all instances except for the team that just starts the game. And the team that just starts the game, they only get to have one serve. So they, when, you, when you're starting a game, the, the score is called 0-0-2 because you're in effect already on your second server because you're only going to get to have one person on your team serve for that first uh, exchange. First. The first start. Okay, so, so I mean, so, so would some people even want the other team to have the first kick at the can so that they've actually got two serves in their their next their next round? Okay, so that's a little bit of uh, critical thinking in terms of, of of gameplay, I guess. There, hey. Yeah, it's a little bit of strategy because, um, I mean, like you can't score any points if you don't have the serve. So it is an advantage to start with the serve. You can start scoring points right away. But it is yeah. true that you only get to have one person starting uh, and then it's going to go back to the other teams and then they're going to get two chances. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 it usually doesn't have a large effect uh, because the serve usually goes back and forth many times within a game. But if yeah. the team uh, does get a lot of points on their first server, then it can make a big difference to start with the serve. Okay, I don't know. That makes sense. That makes sense. And your, uh, the next question here is, uh, so you're alluding to the fact that resistance training uh, is more uh, critical of a warm-up than doing stretches before before the, the class. Did I have that right too? So that's that's. No, really, what I think is more important is aerobic exercise. So uh, something that's going to get your body, you get your heart pumping, 
and your blood flowing, that is more important than doing stretching. So really what we actually want to do in a warm up is truly warm up the muscles. So increase the temperature in them, not just lengthen them by stretching. So um, what's more important in a warm up is the uh, aerobic component of it rather than flexibility. And usually we wouldn't do resistance training. And again, also until we've warmed up first. Right, right. Okay, so you got to get your body moving, get a little bit of a sweat going, and then you're ready to get get into the game or or get into your other activity there. Um, right, right. Awesome. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, what about uh, footwear? Is there anything uh, that people should be looking at if they're if they're figuring out their footwear if they're just getting started there? Mm -hmm. So a court shoe is definitely recommended. Um, and you also want to pay attention, ideally, if you can, uh, have some different shoes for indoor play versus outdoor play if you, if you switch with the seasons. You'll find that the grips are a little bit different on outdoor shoes, and they also might be a little bit more durable. So if you're going to play outdoors, especially on some of the tennis courts or the um, outdoor hockey rink surfaces that we have in Winnipeg, then I would recommend you pretty much need to go to an outdoor tennis shoe. Whereas with an indoor uh, with indoor play, you could check you could play with tennis shoes, but I, I find most people are playing with um, a badminton shoe or a, something you would use for um, even volleyball, squash, squash, racquetball. They tend to have a little bit less of a sole and a little bit flatter surface, uh, and also very good grips for a gym floor. So definitely a court shoe. Um, and you might even differentiate between your indoor and outdoor shoes. Right, right. And obviously, non, non-marking soles if you're on the floor here at Wellness, that's for sure. Um, okay, so just as a heads up as well too, so members can book courts here uh, up to 24 hours in advance. And if you're going to play here at Wellness in terms of a drop-in, I just recommend that folks just give a call to our front desk first to see what kind of availability is open. Uh, and then they can reserve some time there as well too. So um, that's that's my suggestion. If you're going to play here at Wellness, if, uh, if the weather's a little ugly outside like it is today, then, then uh, coming down to Wellness and giving it a shot here is definitely a great idea. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. If there's anything else, uh, no, it looks like we're good to go. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber, for, for uh, speaking to us about pickleball today. Uh, for everybody here that's watching, we will have this uh, uh, webinar available on our website at wellnessinstitute.ca slash wellnesswebinars. Uh, so you can come and refer back to this and, or send it to your friends. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.